So, welcome to this uh, Digimap Data in QGIS webinar. My name's Tom Armitage, and I'm here with my colleague Ian Holmes. So, we're going to take you through um, the steps of obtaining data from Digimap, uh, and then how to use that in QGIS. After the webinar, we will, um, obviously we're recording this, so we'll put the recording on YouTube, we'll put the slides and a transcript of all the questions and answers will go onto uh, our help pages and we'll email a link to where all of that is after the uh, after the webinar. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, we're going to have a look at the data that's available from uh, data download um, and then how you use that to get the data specifically for QGIS, so which formats to pick, that sort of thing. And then we're going to look at uh, loading that data into QGIS uh, and then styling it and then we're going to run through a few tips on clipping out areas, merging tiles together, a look at a few of the plugins. There's some really great resources as well. So let's get started. So first of all, here is the, the GMAP homepage. Um, yours may look a little bit different at your institution. It just depends on how many collections that you subscribe to. But as you can see down the left hand side here, here are all the different collections that we've got. So um, what, what have we got available from Ordnance Survey? We've pretty much got the full range of Ordnance Survey's maps and data. I think really the only key data set that we don't have from Ordnance Survey is their address-based data because there's a, a slight different licensing thing with that one. Historic Digimap has all the Ordnance Survey maps from 1843 right through to the 1990s when they went digital first. So uh, up to that point, all the maps were made uh, on paper originally uh, and then if there was digital data it was it was taken from the paper map um, and these are available in scales from 1 to 500 the really detailed town plans all the way through up to um, 1 to 10,560 I think which is the six inch to a mile scale maps um, we've got geology data from British Geological Survey, onshore and offshore, a range of their different data sets, mainly focusing on the key uh, geology data, but also some hydrogeology, soils, uh, flooding data sets, that sort of, th that sort of thing from, from the BGS. Marine Digimap has sea zone data for those sort of marine and coastal zones, um, both raster charts and vector marine um, data as well. Environment, we've got the land cover data sets. Um, we've got the, in there, we've got the Dudley stamp data, which dates from the 1930s. And then we've got the 1990, 2000, 2007, and 2015 land cover data sets. Uh, aerial Digimap has 25 centimeter resolution aerial photography from Get Mapping. And finally, our newest collection, the LIDAR data, uh, and that's from the Environment Agency and Scottish uh, Environment Protect, environmental Protection Agency, uh, and that's um, some very high resolution uh, digital terrain models and digital surface models as well. So all, this, all these data sets available from Digimap can be used in QGIS in one form or another. But remember, you might not have access to all those different collections. So to begin with, we're going to have a look at actually obtaining the data out of uh, the data download services. So every single one of the collections has its own data download interface. Uh, and this is where you get the, uh, the data from. It's a three-step process. So the first thing you do is go into data download, drag a box, or set use coordinates to select your area that you're interested in. The next step is to choose the data from the panel on the left hand side and you can see they open and expand and you can access loads of different data sets. Um, we've put them into categories to help you navigate that, that process. And then once you've ticked those boxes, you add the data to your basket where you can change options such as format, version and layers. So here's a little look at that, uh, selecting the data. This is the uh, Ordnance Survey. It's a bit old. We've added quite a few more data sets since the image was captured. But you can see we've got the OS Master Map as its own separate collection at the top there, which is the really detailed topographic mapping. But we've got building heights and transport networks, water networks, uh, information about um, specific sites as well. So really, really rich data there. Backdrop backdrop mapping or background mapping. Um, this is all the raster maps. So uh, things like the 
digital versions of the uh, Land Ranger or um, uh, Explorer maps from Ordnance Survey. But it's raster data, so it comes in tiles, and they're all sort of TIFF data that you can put straight into your GIS. Land and height data, so there's some vector contours and, and point uh, spot heights in there, but there's also the digital terrain models from Ordnance Survey, um, and that's at 50 uh, meter and 5 meter resolution um, there. Vector data, uh, a whole range of different um, products in there, um, but all points, lines, and polygons data, um, ranging from scale. So just above the Ordnance Survey master map, you've got vector map local, right the way up to um, things like the strategy data. Boundary and location data, that's the mainly things like the postcode boundaries, uh, gazetteers of place names, but also the boundary line data sets in there with all the different administrative boundaries that uh, you can imagine. And finally, we have a withdrawn data sets uh, section where you can access some of the data that the Ordnance Survey don't supply anymore, um, things like the old um, panorama and uh, profile DTM and contour data and a few other data sets in there that the Ordnance Survey have sort of stopped providing over the years. Also in there is the landline data, which was the precursor to master maps. So if you're wanting detailed data from sort of the early 2000s, um, that's where you access that. Um, to help you choose your data or select your areas, there's also this availability grid, which uh, highlights where the data you're looking at is available for. So for most of the Ordnance Survey data sets, it's national coverage at all, at all scales. But things like the building heights data, uh, which is what we're looking at here. It, it, it's only focused in on, on, on urban areas at the moment. Um, for other data sets as well, there's, there's sort of limited coverage. This really is most important in the historic Digimap collection where uh, different ages of data um, have very different and very limited coverages. So it's really good to look at these to see where you uh, want the data. It also gives you the tile names that are available, which you can then use in your selecting area. You can just type in the tile name if that's the precise area you're interested in, and that can help. Or you may want to use it to define a, a, a 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer square so that you can capture the same data across different, uh, different data sets, capture the same area. Once you've got the data in the basket, um, this is where you choose the version, um, which is basically the date of the data, um, and the format, whichever formats are available for that particular data set, uh, and also the layers, particularly things like uh, master map topography or boundary line. You can just tease out the information you want, such as just the buildings from master map or just the um, uh, historic counties or ceremonial county boundaries from the boundary line data set. So what formats do you need to choose for QGIS? Um, well, if you're looking at vector data, uh, the best option to go for from, from data download is, is shapefile. Um, although it's a, an ESRI format, it's now become a bit of a default vector format for all GIS software, and that's the easiest one to open in QGIS. Um, master map isn't available in shapefile format, but it is available in file geodatabase. Again, it's a, it's a sort of an ESRI format, but um, QGIS can open it. It, it, it is only, it is read only, so it, you can open it and style it, but you can't save any changes that you've made, but you can always save as a different format, which is very simple in QGIS, and then um, continue to edit that, that new file that you've saved in a different format. GML, there's usually another option that you can take that's better, but sometimes if you're dealing with large quantities of data that's been split up into tiles, sometimes it's good to take the GML and then convert it into another format, uh, merging together all the different um, chunks um, uh, that have come in your order. Um, TIFF is the best format for raster data when you're looking at the, uh, the backdrop mapping. Uh, and then for those DTM data sets, you're best taking the ASC format, which will open up very nicely in, in QGIS. So looking at those shapefile availabilities, pretty much every product in the vector data category is available in shapefile formats. Uh, and same with the Terrain 5 and Terrain 50 contours. You can take them as shapefiles and just, just open them up. So we've done that conversion for you. The Ordnance Survey supplies usually in GML. Um, 
and then we'll, we've converted it for you. The reason we don't offer it for master map is that it's very easy to create a master map download that's more than two gigabytes, and that is the size limit for a shape file. So um, we, we've opted with the file geo database once we found out that QGIS can open that too. So yes, here's, here's um, recommendations on that there. So there, there is the option to take the GML. Um, there's uh, the old Interpose um, software created by Dotted Eyes, which will translate um, Digimap's version of the GML data into a shapefile, which you can open in QGIS. Or there is actually a plugin for QGIS called Ordnance Survey Translator. Um, GML's fine, it will just open on its own Q in QGIS, but it, it, it limits the, the feature types that you can you can have in there and divide the, the data up and use to style the data. Uh, and when you convert it, you can merge those chunks together from your order, so it, it ends up as a continuous data set, which is usually what you're looking for, particularly as there can be duplicates between um, two chunks where, where a feature crosses the border. So this is the data that um, Ordnance Survey Translator plugin has created there. It's, it's really good. As I said, it can process those multiple chunks, uh, and it creates a shape file which you can then style in a nice, consistent way. Raster data. Um, the TIFF just opens up very nicely. Um, we supply our TIFFs mainly with TIFF world files. Some of them come with as geo TIFFs. Um, so they don't have an extra file, but uh, yeah, they open very nicely in, in QGIS and the ASC format there as well, which which we've got for the DTM data um, from Ordnance Survey, but also the LiDAR data and the uh, gridded bathymetry from um, the marine um, download as well. That 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 comes in uh, ASC format. There is a big guide in the help pages. As I said, you, you'll have um, uh, access to the the, uh, the slides afterwards, so you can pick up that rather long uh, link there. But um, there's a guide in there, and that final column there shows you what to ch the best options to choose um, when you're downloading the data, which which format to take, and then how to convert it if if you need need to. So when you get the data download, you get a, a zip file, uh, and in there you've got your folder, which contains each product. You've got the contents order, which is a text file that just lists what you ordered, the areas that you've taken. One thing to, to note, though, is that citations text file in there as well. So if you're using this in a thesis or a report where you are, are citing all the um, the different references that you've used for doing the, uh, the the reading and the research, but it's also very good to cite the data that you've used and, and, and give credit to the people that created it in the first place. So we create citations for all the different uh, data sets and uh, crediting the, uh, the, the data creators. Um, so it's good practice to do that. But before you um, take the data out of the, uh, the shapefile, it's really good to extract it uh, before you use the data in the zip file it's very good to extract it into a folder um, your na native winzip or, or 7zip these sorts of functions will just take take the data straight out and, and put it into a folder uh, um, it's very good to think of this before you start using the data in a GIS is to think about your data management where you're storing it how you're storing it what your folder structure is going to be like where are you going to save the outputs from your, your, your research, that sort of thing. And just have a, a good think about that before you start so that um, you don't end up in a, in a bit of a confused mess later on when you've got halfway through your, your research. So QGIS itself, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's now clearly the leading open source GIS. It is free to download and free to use. Um, you are, Get it from www.qgis.org. Um, there's a download page that allows you to take versions for Windows 32-bit, Windows 64-bit, um, Mac computers, and Linux as well. So there's there's no limit on on which um, operating sy operating system it is that you're using. There's a there's a native version for each one. 
Um, you have long-term releases and latest versions. Long-term releases are, are usually supported for at least a year. Uh, and that's good if you're doing sort of teaching materials, teaching classes, that sort of stuff. You don't have to change the software. It gets the bug fixes periodically, so there are sort of point releases within that version. Um, but uh, the general look of the interface and everything doesn't change. Um, and you've got, usually these are the ones that people who write help guides and, and uh, supporting material focus on the long-term releases so they're often the best ones to use but the latest versions have all the latest features and new uh, new things as well um, usually if there's a sort of a major flaw in the software that'll come along in the latest version a fix for that um, but they're not quite as well documented documented that sort of stuff uh, so I tend to use the the latest long-term release uh, we've we've kind of stuck on one at the moment, so it's been been out for uh, a couple of years now as we're waiting for a, a huge, massive change to QGIS, which I'll talk about at the end. So once you've got the uh, software on your desktop, before you sort of really get to throwing in lots of data and things like that, there's some settings that you can choose. Um, so you open up the software, look at the settings, um, menu across the top there, it's the um, fifth one along, and go down to the options. Um, and here you can sort of set some defaults. Uh, in the general tab at the very top of the options box, you can actually change the language, and QGIS is, is, comes in a huge variety of different languages. As it being open source, the people that are using it in different countries will, will, will do a lot of the translation um, work and, and produce a different language version. So if um, English isn't your first language, you can you can change QGIS to hopefully be be in your first language. Um, the main thing to look at here is is setting the coordinate reference system. Um, the first thing to do is automatically enable on the fly reprojection. So if you've got layers of different projections, QGIS will handle that automatically and always uh, put it into the default projection. You can set the default in here as well. Uh, if what you're doing is mostly British data, that tends to be what we do here at, um, at Digimap because we, we're always having the, the GB data sets from Ordnance Survey and the other providers. We set ours to uh, be default in, in British National Grid, which you can just quickly choose using the EPSG code uh, 27700 and set that so every time you open a new project it always defaults to being British National Grid. Um, in the middle there, I don't know if you can make it out on the lower picture, there's a CRS for new layers. You can actually automatically set that as well if you know that the only thing you're ever going to put in there is British National Grid data then you can actually set it up so it will always use that British National Grid or use the project's CRS. I tend to leave it as prompt for CRS because sometimes I'm bringing in data from other sources. So if I have added another data set, say from a GPS device, I want it to ask me what coordinate reference system it's in rather than assuming it's British National Grid and, and not bringing in the data properly. So getting it to prompt when you're adding new stuff is helpful. However, if you're just using British National Grid and you keep throwing in another 10 or 50 raster tiles of, of DTM data, having to click British National Grid on every single one can be very tiresome, so it is quite good to uh, you know have this as an option so you can get it to just use the default or just use the project CRS and everything will come straight in. <laughs> Saving the map, so much like ArcGIS if you've ever used that as well, map documents are saved as, as, as map files. These save the styling that you've applied, the zoom levels, other changes that you've made to the to the setup of the map, that sort of thing, but not the data itself. That is kept in those data files. So if you um, save a map and then delete the data from their folder or move the folder that has the data in, um, the map will break. So you, you need to bear that in mind as part of your data management um, thinking. You need to bear all of this in mind. Have a, have a place where your map documents are saved, have a place where your data is saved, and make sure they stay in the same place relative to each other. Um, so there could be a top folder that you can move around. But as long as the, you keep your data and your maps in the relative same place, don't change the names outside of QGIS of your, of your data sets, uh, and then everything will be okay. Um, in the, when you first open QGIS, you get this browser panel, 
and that can actually you can set up favorite folders so you can quickly get to the the uh, the folder where you're where you know you've put all your data and drag them into the into the layer panel rather than having to sort of add data so it makes things really really nice quick and speedy to 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 get your data in and out adding data in the normal way without doing that drag and drop um you have a different add button for um uh, all the different data sets. This is something that's going in the in the next version of QGIS, but um, for now it's still there. And actually, in the next version, you click a button and it and then it asks you the same question: Is it one of these data set types? The key ones to know about are the raster, add raster data, which looks like a little chessboard, add vector data, which is the the, the the dotty line, and adding CSV data, which is if you've got a, a spreadsheet or a CSV file with lots of data in it. Um, Sometimes that can have coordinates, sometimes it's just attribute information that you're going to attach to a, a vector data set, um, but that's how you bring that in there. So adding uh, a raster data couldn't be easier really, you just um, click on that button, browse to the folder with the raster data in, and then you can use control sh or shift to select multiple tiles and bring them all in at the same time. Equal shape file data, click on the, the add vector data button, Click Browse, locate your shapefile, and click Open. Uh, couldn't be easier. File to your database, slight difference there. You click on your Add Vector layer, um, go into um, the, the bit there, and you choose a directory as a source type rather than just a, a file, which is what you would use for shapefile. Um, then you can pick the Open File to your database format, browse to your geodatabase, click Open. It'll give you a list of the different um, uh, layers within the file to your database. And you can add one or all of them from there. Um, and this is you end up with something that looks here. As I said, you can't edit a file to your database in QGIS, but you can just then go on and save that um, uh, data as a shape file or as a geo package, and then um, and then edit it from there. With the CSV data, again, click on the appropriate button, browse to your data. Uh, it does a bit of work. It looks at your data, makes some judgments about what it thinks the uh, delimiters are. If it's not a comma, you can tell it what it is to, to use as the delimiter. Um, it'll guess whether your first record has field names in it or not. Um, and then there's the things like you. it might get right which is the X field and Y field. If it's spatial data, you might have to tell it. Um, and if it's not spatial data, you might have to check the no geometry box. And that just brings it in as a, as a table, which you can then join to another data set. Say here we've got postcodes. You could join this post, postcode information onto a, a, a spatial data set that has postcode areas or postcode points. As long as you've got a common attribute to both tables, you can do the join there. And here, this is the um, uh, postcodes displayed for Edinburgh. So styling vector data in QGIS, um, this is done through uh, using the style tab. You basically add your data in. It comes in looking like the data in on the left with random colors assigned to lines and, and polygons and that sort of stuff. So you're going to really, if you want it to look like a map, like the data on the right there, you're going to have to apply some sort of um, cartographic styling. So in this, there is a um, right click on your data set and go to the, the, the properties and there is a style tab here so you can apply your colors line thicknesses that sort of stuff um, you can do it based on categories or based on attribute values that sort of thing you can set all of that up in in QGIS uh, in the latest versions there's actually something called a styling dock a live styling dock and if you click just press F7 on your keyboard this opens on the right hand side of the map from versions 2.16 onwards. And actually, as you make the changes, the map updates to reflect this. Uh, you can pause that if you've got a lot of data on the screen, or you can zoom into a sample area and make your changes. But it really does help to see it as you're doing it, um, rather than having to keep clicking apply and looking at the map, waiting for it to update. So um, there's some really, really good stuff in there. And there's some really advanced features in QGIS now. I mean, this is come on a huge amount recently it's very very good so we've got two and a half d styling which allows you to project up the the, the polygons or um, or lines by an attribute so here we've got buildings done by height you can see it's not great in certain areas this the, the drawing order hasn't got gone quite right but if your data is quite simple to look at it it's really effective 
Um, there's a heat map version, so you, if you've got a point data set, you can just click the heat map tab, set a few options, and then view your point data sets. Here it's um, postcodes weighted by how many delivery points, domestic delivery points there are in each postcode. So you can see here a density map of, of, of uh, deliv domestic delivery points in Edinburgh. Um, if you've put in a DTM layer uh, or a train model, there's a hill shade option. You just tick the hill shade box, um, hill shade styling option, set where you want the sun to be and what ang angle the sun is at. And there you can see um, it turns your DTM straight into a hill shade layer. Blend modes are something that you can do as well. So what we saw on the the this map here, I just use a transparency on this heat map, and it's kind of washed out the the, uh, the backdrop mapping. By using blend modes, it just m multiplies or whatever it is you want to, whichever feature blend mode you're using, it just mixes the colors between the layers without that washed out effect. So I've got three layers here, geology, um, hill shading, uh, using the, the, the previous thing we looked at there, and uh, a backdrop map, which just tick a box and grayscale, um, really simple in the styling for the, um, the the raster map. But all three layers there, without you, you can see the elements of each one very clearly without it um, being washed out by using transparencies. So if you're doing it with three la three layers, it would have looked quite quite awful with the transparency. By using those blend modes, it's brilliant. And draw effects, you can put things on lines, points, lines, polygons, uh, things like outer glows, inner glows blurs and tinting and coloring so here this, this is earthquake data on the left hand side there um, I've, I've scaled the points by the magnitude of the earthquake and then layered up different uh, different layers with different uh, outer glows of different colors to give this sort of really nice effect on the right hand side that's Strava data for uh, a European city and just putting outer glows and and uh, on on the lines varying the thicknesses of the lines by the number of times it was cycled down uh, you can create these sort of really good data visualizations um, styling files are available the ordnance survey provide them so you can actually download them um, if you in the help you can go click on a and well if you're in the data download and you go to the product information page um, you can go to the more info which takes you to our um, Digimap help pages for each product and then there'll be a, a link out to where the symbology files are provided by the, um, the, the data supplier. So Ordnance Survey are very good at providing uh, styling for both ArcGIS and QGIS. So we are almost run out of time but I'm just going to quickly take you through some of the um, common geoprocessing tools that you've got in, um, in QGIS. So quite often when you've taken a lot of data sets, you've got individual tiles of data, you want to merge them together. So in, if you've got vector data, this is terrain contours, go to the vector menu, data management tools, the very bottom option down here and across, and there's merge shape files to one. And that just allows you to merge all of those vector data sets into a single data, data, uh, data layer. Same again in raster, raster menu, miscellaneous and merge, and that merges your raster data together. Um, have to be careful merging raster data because if um, they've got limited um, color bands and there are different colors in different squares, you might end up with some strange color effects there. But if it's um, the Ordnance Survey's data, that's not a problem. The one that we have seen this being an issue is the raster master map that we've created. We've um, condensed it down into um, a, a smaller number of colors, uh, but those colors are different on different tiles, so you can get some strange effects when merging those. So you might want to, instead of build the virtual raster rather than merging the data, which allows you to treat it as one thing, but it still remains as separate files. The clip tool. So uh, another common thing is that you've downloaded a, uh, the data comes on a 100 by 100 kilometer square, but you're only interested in a small piece in the middle. Um, you can use the clip tool. There's a vector version and a raster. Um, the vector version, you have to use a, um, a an area that you've already got existing in another um, polygon, that sort of thing. So you can use a smaller data set to take, um, take a chunk out of the bigger one. Uh, the raster clipper allows you, I think you can actually just drag a box to select your area that you want to clip to. Um, plugins, must talk about QGIS as plugins because that's how there's a lot of extended functionality. You get them from the plugins menu, manage and install plugin, 
manage and install plugins. There's some great ones out there. They're all free. There's no extra money uh, required to, to get these plugins. Just a quick run through of some of our favorites. Um, there's two that we use for web-based maps, Quick Map Services, which is just a vast number, hundreds and hundreds of different um, online web mapping. You can see here we've got this the um, uh, OpenStreetMap in the watercolor style, but loads of different uh, things, OpenStreetMap, Google Maps, Bing Maps, all of these things, hundreds and hundreds of different layers. Um, it's very, very quick. The, the, the map's piped in at the back very fast. Um, the thing with quick map services is sometimes you'll find it, it just breaks and it doesn't work. It's getting a bit more reliable, but um, it, it, it's not, not always the best. There is a much more stable um, version of the same thing called the Open Layers plugin, but you've got a much, much smaller choice. Um, but most of the key good data sets are in Open Layers. Um, the, uh, the, it is a bit slower though, and sometimes you sort of, if, as you pan along, um, a map tile doesn't appear and you end up with white squares which is a bit frustrating um, so it depends on what you're what you're using it for but choose one of those for web-based maps MMQGIS is a bit of a um, Swiss army knife of a, of a plugin um, but it, it's really good for doing things like creating hexagons uh, hexagon layer it creates a shape file of hexagons which you can use for sampling data or you can you can create grids, squares, these sorts of things. But there's a whole load of other different things in there for geocoding, searching, uh, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, QGIS to 3JS is, is currently uh, probably one of my favorite plugins. What that does is if you've got a, a DTM in your data or you've, you've got um, a vector data set that you, such as buildings where the attributes of height, you can use this plugin to create a 3D scene. Just use a bit of the setup here, uh, and what it creates is something like this. So here we're seeing the building heights extruded up from the polygons. This is sat on top of a DTM. There's not a lot of topography in this area, so you can't really see that, but the buildings are sat on a real surface. And what it's created here is actually just a website, and it puts it into a little folder with all the different bits of JavaScript it needs. So you can actually just send this to someone else, and it just works. Um, you can zoom, pan, flip around, sort of fly around this this sort of 3D scene um, just just with a, a web browser. Really, really useful. Um, a few others to mention, QGIS to web. You set your, your map up in QGIS just as you want it. You go into QGIS to web, click a few buttons, and it will actually publish a web map interface using your data and the base maps that you may have been using. It absolutely uh, fantastic. Um, way to do things. It's really, really quick, really easy, and you don't really need to know how to create a website. It just creates it all for you. One thing to remember there is not to publish licensed data, such as the, the things that you get from one survey. As long as they're open data sets, you're okay to put them onto a public website, but if they're licensed, you can't. It doesn't mean you can't create a web map. It just means you can't put it on a public web server. So you could create one to show to your people in the class, that sort of thing. There's a cartogram plugin which creates cartograms, really, really good fun. A terrain analysis plugin that lets you do slope and aspect and a lot of the other um, features when you're analyzing a DTM. Zonal statistics, so we created those, car um, those hexagons using the MMQGIS plugin. With the zonal statistics, we could use that to um, summarize raster data that's underneath it, really good for things like land cover mapping. You could have polygon outline. Uh, of, of um, um, an estate, and then you could use zonal statistics to um, summarize all the different land cover types that are within that, that polygon. So really, really useful plugins. And there's hundreds and hundreds more. So very, very finally, um, there's more information on our resource center, Digimaps Resource Center, which you can access from the home page. Uh, just click on the resource center. It's a link at the top right of the Digimap homepage. And there's loads of help material in there. Focusing in, there's this sort of in the GIS and CAD resources section, there is a section just for QGIS. So this is where you would get to the resource center, look for the, uh, the blue box saying GIS CAD resources, and there's the QGIS data, uh, QGIS section in there. Uh, and also in the learning and teaching zone, there's a working with GIS and CAD section. So you get PDF of a sort of step-by-step -step guide uh, and the data that you need to complete it are all in there. If you get stuck, um, we have the chat option or you can just email the Adina help desk. The chat's usually manned in office hours. You can email us at any time and we'll get back to you um, usually in the next working day 
with with a bit of a, a response sometimes it takes a bit longer it depends how awkward your question is and uh, that's it um, so we'll be hanging around for just a couple of minutes if you have any uh, further questions uh, as I said there'll be the uh, slides and a recording of this and the transcript of all the different questions we get coming out um, probably hopefully tomorrow maybe early next week thank you very much for listening <laughs>